watching Transition from the Past to the Future, you know, thank you for your service. Thank you. Place. Thank you. And I'm curious if how that affected your global perspective of the U.S. to a degree. And I personally think that it's possible to live in a era without war. Mm. I think that if, but it would take the species coming together and be like, we can't stand for this anymore. And but the U.S. has a disproportionate role in playing that. I'm just curious if you could briefly touch on the, your experiences overseas and just how that affected your perspective. Yeah, can I just add, I, yeah. and, and hearing it also, what did you actually do in Iraq? I mean, what were your responsibilities yeah. there yeah. and how did that affect what Tom's asking? So it's, I love your question. Um, I enlisted in 2002, a little bit after 9-11 because my father had served, my grandfather had served. Mm -hmm. And I'll never get my father saying, you know, you, your responsibility as a citizen is to serve in some way. Mm -hmm. He told me I didn't need to serve in the military. Mm -hmm. He said it's an option. And so that was ingrained in me. Mm -hmm. So um, in 07, and I was against the Iraq war. In 07, I got a call to go uh, to Iraq to go get deployed. Around that same time, I learned Tassie was pregnant with our first child. And I'll never forget getting that call because I, you know, if there was a moment where I wanted to try to get out of it, you know, but I did it because thousands of men and women had done it and it was my responsibility to do. Um, what did I learn? I spent a year in Iraq as an intelligence specialist. But day to day and you were looking at maps or telling people? Day to day, it depended on the day, you know, mm -hmm. I moved around a little bit, uh, Mosul, mm -hmm. Kirkuk, Erbil, mm -hmm. um, supported the Marines and uh, the Army and their missions and uh, so um, it was an incredible experience um, twofold one I was with men and women that didn't share the same skin color as me mm -hmm. geography of me politics of me um, and we were on that base and we came in strangers we left brothers and sisters mm -hmm. it was I learned so much about how to work with people and lead people that maybe didn't agree with my ideology, maybe didn't necessarily like the way I looked. Um, it really helped me in future engagements and being the mayor and other places. The second thing um, that it made me appreciate is uh, the cost of war in a way that I understood intellectually and from a moral standpoint. Um, the first few months I was there, we lost uh, one of my one of the folks in my, on my base. Um, and it was scary and shocking because he was on a routine mission, uh, you know, and going out there and there was an accident where he flipped over. But it just, rem it rem the, his death, Sturdivant, um, reminded me of the cost of war. I would see these massive, um, huge vehicles coming back to the base. Some of them were parked in the base that were just shred apart. And I would think to myself, my God, who was in there, you know. Those images stay with, you know, they, sure. they continue to stay with me. Back to your point, you know, the United States, um, you know, I hope learned the lesson of Iraq, uh, one of the most damaging decisions in foreign policy history, history mm -hmm. foreign policy in the United States. I don't know that we've learned it politically, but it reminds us, I think, of the responsibility the United States has, not just in starting a war, but in trying to end wars. Mm -hmm. um, the power of diplomacy. Actually, you know, I don't like the term soft power. A lot of people use it. Mm -hmm. I don't think it is soft power. I think it's hard power mm -hmm. to be able to um, bring a coalition together negotiate things politically rather than going to continuing to um, some of these endless wars. So I, I, my basic thinking around it is we've got to get to a, a place where war is not the first option. It is the last option. We need to really do a thorough examination of deployment of uh, troops and special operators around the world. We have to take a real look at that with Congress why are we in certain parts of Africa do we need to be? Why are we in certain parts of the Middle East do we need to be on the ground? We've got to really 
have an aggressive in that examination of that, look at what it means for our security, and then I assume make some decisions of not staying, but diplomatically ensuring that uh, those areas are secure without having uh, the kind of military presence. So, Seti, you're going to find this amazing, at least I do. We are in the last part now, just about 10 no, minutes no. left. I know. Well, <laughs> I don't believe uh, that. Of this show. I don't um, believe that. But um, let's talk about what you're doing today, yeah. uh, what your hopes are for it, and let's also broaden it to be, in a sense, in conversation with our audience. We have uh, titled this show, Creating the World We Want. So uh, I joke that it's not getting stuck with the world um, and that somebody else left us with. So how do we figure out what we want? How do we establish our politics? What's the role of the media? How can we, regular citizens, engage? But start by telling us, you know, the, you're the executive director of the uh, Joan Shorenstein Center at uh, the Harvard Kennedy School. What is that? And I will, and just before we get to the last 10 minutes, okay. I just, in all seriousness, I really, appreciate the fact that you're doing this, Bob. Yeah. I mean, this is so important, the two of you, but yeah. I, you know, I, I think that, that the issues are so important. The fact that you stepped up and you're, you, you're creating this forum is so important. So thank you for you're doing it. Welcome. It's really important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and tell everybody me. about it over at the KSU. Oh, I will. I'm telling everyone. I'm <laughs> okay, telling everyone. <laughs> so I, I've been part of the, the, the um, Shorenstein Center as its executive director since last July. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, um, Shorenstein Center on Media, Public Policy, and Politics, the intersection of all three. Mm -hmm. The reason why I decided to join is because of what we're facing today. Right. Our democracy is being challenged. Mm -hmm. And at this moment, when you look at the media, mm -hmm. loss of traditional journalism, mm -hmm. right? The collapse, absolute collapse. Mm -hmm. Thousands of jobs have been lost. Newsrooms closing, news deserts, right? the proliferation of misinformation, disinformation on these platforms mm -hmm. where people are getting their news, mm -hmm. you know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, mm -hmm. all the rest. Uh, the uh, public policy, really serious public policy challenges we have. You mentioned a little earlier, mm -hmm. one of my fears is that we're not talking about public policy right now in the media. We're talking about the horse race. Mm -hmm. Who's up, who's down, who won, who lost. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, what we're not talking about is what policies are in place or not in place to address the defining issue of our time, economic inequality, the defining challenge of our time, climate change, right? Mm -hmm. Third, our politics. Look at all the surveys, particularly people under 30. Every single survey I've seen, you know, and particular ones that have come out of Harvard, um, IOP, other places, are clearly showing people are having less confidence in traditional institutions, the media, government, our court system. So we are in a very dangerous time. The center, um, its effort to provide practical solutions, we can go into some of those, as well as really deep research around what's happening in the media, what's happening in public policy and politics is needed. Uh, so we have uh, some great work going on right now. We have world-leading expert, a woman named Joan Donovan, on uh, media manipulation. Mm -hmm. She is uh, cranking out solid, good, practical research that newsrooms can use mm -hmm. to try to figure out how they're being manipulated by some of these pl platforms. Um, I won't say their names because I don't want to. I don't want to give no, them I mean, more can play. You give, can you give our viewers some thoughts about and our listeners some thoughts about uh, any tidbits or guidelines, or warnings that you can uh, share from her research or from your own experience? Yeah, I think well, the broader the broader ch thing that we've got to do mm -hmm. um, broadly is really equip people with tools mm -hmm. to understand. You know, people get information through these platforms. And they don't know if it's an actual, who, they, who the people are that's spreading the information. They don't know someone that they know, someone they don't know. Even if someone that they know, how do you verify mm -hmm. whether it's true or not? I mean, mm -hmm. because, so these are, these are the places we're going, you know. Mm -hmm. Majority of people get their news from television right now. Mm -hmm. But a vast majority of people are getting news from, their, from these platforms. I mean, Facebook, I'm, I'm mentioning all these. So 
from a practical standpoint, how do we equip the media and human beings mm -hmm. with the capacity to desegregate some of these things and mm -hmm. figure out what's real? In them? That's just one space mm -hmm. um, that we have to, we have to, a couple other areas. What is the, what is the, what is the new business model for local news? Mm -hmm. There is a, there's some great research down at UNC right now uh, that's looking at the association of decrease in voting, a decrease in voting, and decrease of local news. Mm -hmm. They're re actually they correlate, correlate yeah. together. Mm -hmm. So these are, these are areas where we're looking at. What is that model? You know, you and I chatted a little bit before we started. Um, I don't think there's an answer out there, not that we've seen, but there's experimentation. and. You know, we've got to make sure we, we're getting people fact-based news. If I could ask you just to link sure. what you're learning a little bit to what we went through in the campaign. I mean, um, uh, my parents are journalists. I'm not instinctively anti-press, but I was really struck by what seemed to be a decision that uh, the governor's race wasn't worth any attention. Um, and uh, this is, goes beyond a question of ego. It goes to... Uh, where are we headed? What, what, are we, what choices are we being asked to make? And I would say particularly uh, in my own campaign, I kept trying to draw attention to things. Where do we want to be 10 years from now and what decisions do we need to make today so that that's likely to happen? This was really not discussed. So uh, now you kind of have multiple perspectives. You've been a mayor, you've been a candidate for governor, and you've, uh, now you're looking forward. Um, how, would you, how, would, how could we start to address those problems, a kind of absence of coverage here and then distorted coverage there. And my only addition to that is, yeah, is it intentional or is it manipulation? Yeah, well, those well, sound I, like similar. But I, yeah. I, I think there's a few things at play here. Yeah. I think that you, you do have a hollowing out of reporters, yeah. people that are able to cover stories. That's one piece of it. I mean, just pure number yeah. of reporters now, you know, 20 years ago, there's just a... Yeah, Boston Globe used to have a foreign policy bureau. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they had yeah. correspondents around yeah. the world. My, my hometown paper, Newton Tab, when I became their publisher, editor, two reporters, I walked out the door 2017, and, and the Boston Globe had a reporter covering me, Globe West, or Newton. Walked out the door, no Globe West anymore, one reporter at the Newton Tab covering st multiple communities. I mean, this is what's happening. Right, right. So I do think that one of the things that we have to think about is what is that model? The second thing we're gonna to have to think about, frankly, in this program as an example of it, how do we, the growth of this kind of discussion, mm -hmm. this format, mm -hmm. this, you know, the thought that we're gonna go back to where we were 20 years ago mm -hmm. may not be mm -hmm. the answer. What may be the answer is looking at these new mediums and having real, this kind of conversation um, the kind of journalism that could actually have growth, right? Television podcasts, podcasts, and other mediums. I was talking to someone the other day about this very question um, uh, who's been in the news, run a major magazine. She said to me, I think what's going to have to happen is journalists are going to have to adjust to the new medium mm -hmm. and use their, their toolkit of verification, real questions, you know, to be answered, substance. In other words, adapt to the medium. So... These are just things that are, people are experimenting and trying. Certainly, we're going to we're going to research it. We're going to look at it. Okay. So, last question, because we're really sadly running out of time. But you mentioned your concern about inequality right at the beginning, and now you're at the uh, Shorenstein Center. Um, so, uh, we chatted very briefly. Um, what are your thoughts about addressing both the policy and the coverage of uh, of, of inequality? Thank you, Bob. You know, I, one of the things we're looking at now is how, in the Sherman Scene Center, how can we, in this 2020 news cycle, insert the issue of inequality, lack of economic mobility, mm -hmm. in a substantive way? Mm -hmm. Nonpartisan, but really making sure that people understand where we are and what the practical solutions might be. Mm -hmm. You know, 50, over 51 years ago, Kerner Commission came out. Mm -hmm. This was a report that President Johnson commissioned to look at why these riots were happening in urban areas, black and urban areas. It came down to inequality, came down to racism, came down not to communism not communism, black, black Panthers, Panthers which and, is conspiracy yeah. theory. Right. 
what I would like to see, oh, and also, mm -hmm. there was some critique of how those riots were being reported mm -hmm. by the press. Outside of the community, top down versus the perspective mm -hmm. of the community. Mm -hmm. there's, there's, uh, there's a notion that maybe we do a you know, 20th, 20th, 21st century uh -huh. look, yeah. 51 years later, yeah. not just in urban and black, but perhaps beyond uh, multiracial, geographic, um, and really try to use that as a benchmark to insert this conversation of 2020. Yeah. Well, so I, well, my, one quick final question okay. is, I think the only way we can really counter this income inequality, climate change, is by building movements. We need to come together in solidarity. And I think that's that true. There's, there is a movement, I sense it starting around 1980, that's kind of built the current era in the United States. I'm curious if there's any movements out there that you're particularly fond of or any thoughts on movement building as we wrap the show because hopefully this dialogue facilitates others to have the agency to go for, give energy to the movements they're contributing to now. One of the things I love that's happening is act, people are becoming active mm -hmm. post-2016 and they're not just going after Donald Trump. They're asking their own representatives, their own uh, mayors, member of Congress and otherwise, what do we, what are you doing to address the, these, these two issues. What are you doing to move the needle on economic inequality? What are you doing to move the needle on climate change? And really pressing them. I've not seen this kind of activism um, in my lifetime. I have never seen people literally go to offices the way we've seen. It's terrific. Mm -hmm. um, the, like, the, uh, like my father did, mm -hmm. like my father did. Using these platforms, now these platforms can be challenging, but we're using these platforms to organize, plus side. So I actually have great optimism about this recognition that something needs to be done. Both parties are accountable. Not, you know, the Democrats and the Republicans, both and, or independent, whatever you are. If you're running for office, if you're in office, you need to be held accountable on these issues. I love that, that that's happening now. It needs to continue. I just want to say thank you so much, Seti. It's just a pleasure to be with you. Um, it is always uh, a pleasure to I, be with I, you. I, <laughs> <laughs> even on the trail. Yes, even on the trail. <laughs> and certainly, Seti, we, we look forward to your leadership at the Shorenstein Center and any form you choose to uh, exercise it in the future. And, and Tom? So I just want to give a quick shout out to the CIC, Cambridge Innovation Center, for hosting us here in the Lighthouse space. They're trying to fix the world through innovation, so it really aligns with our values on here, creating the world we want. We want to ensure and thank those who have already reached out to us since we've launched. You know, we appreciate your suggestions. We're listening. Keep emailing us at community at creatingtheworldwewant.org. We're on Spotify, iTunes, YouTube. You know, our website, creatingtheworldwewant.org, is there, open to your viewership, your listening. Um, we really want to create our presence on social media. We want to increase this so that we can effectively reach you. So CW3 Video Podcast on any social media platform is the best way to follow us and our growth of this program. And overall, you know, again, thank you, Seti, for being a Thank you. Today. Thank you. This has been an awesome conversation, and we hope it helps you out there to create the world we want. So thanks. <laughs>